thank you very much for doing that. All right, let's pray before we get into God's word. Lord God, as we have closed our eyes, we're focusing on you. You are the one who has brought us to this place. For those who are seated at home, we thank you that they're with us through this wonderful technology. I praise you, Father, for those who could make it here today and experience the service of one another, the love, the physical presence of one another. I thank you, Lord, for what you have shown me in your word, and I ask God that as we are together now going to study it, Lord, it will, it will change our lives even in just the littlest bit. Oh, Father, we know that our, the change that we experience in our lives is not something that happens uh, 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 drastically day, day over day. I mean, it could happen, but Father, more often than not, it's a slow growth. And we thank you, Lord, that we can look back over our lives and see spiritual growth over time. We praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Would you open up your Bibles to 1 Peter? We're going to begin chapter 4. We have been slowly marching through this wonderful, wonderful uh, book of God's Word, totally and completely convinced that these are God's truths to every single one of us. It doesn't matter how young you are. I mean, who's the youngest person here? How old's the youngest person? Jazzy, how old are you right now? What, eight? Oh, well, I think is she... Uh, uh, Libby, are you eight as well? Yeah. yeah. So, so if I... Uh, and, and Jasper, how old is Jasper? Ten. Two hands. Okay, he's ten. All right, so eight years old. Libby, is the Bible for you? Does the Bible teach you how to do things? The answer is yes. She's like, is this a trick question? <laughs> yes. And our oldest person, and we're not getting into that, but it's also for you as well. See, the Bible is, is God's truth for everyone. And when we come today, we recognize that this isn't just a, a neat little book full of pithy little sayings. This is a book that hits each and every age, and it hits, it hits each and every single one of us. That's what I love about this book. It's like I can preach out you know, whatever, I, whatever the Lord's word is saying, but you're the one that takes it in. You're the one that ingests it. You're the one that eats it, right? Right? You take that truth and you just taste that the Lord is good. Yeah. That's what we're doing today. And that, that's what I, I love about First Peter because First Peter, he addresses reality. He knows that we're going through hard times. You know, he knows, wait a minute, Summer, how old are you? You're nine too, right? Ten? 11. Oh, you're 11 already. Well, it's for, it's for summer as well. So God deals, with, deals in reality. He knows the struggles we're going through, and he recognizes, he knows exactly what you're dealing with. Peter is communicating that in, th in this book, right? Peter tell us, tells us that we can face the trials of life and still have hope. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't be afraid to shout out amen once in a while, all right? Amen. Yeah, we can, we, <laughs> there you go, good. So every day, every day that we live, every trial that we go through, there's still this sense of hope. And Peter says, we do it by looking up. Life is looking up. We're looking at God. We're looking at his purpose for our lives. J.R. Tolkien said this, he said, look up to the sky, there's a light, a beauty up there that no shadow can touch. Right. We have a heavenly purpose in our lives. Each one who's a believer in Jesus Christ, we know that no matter where we are in life, our direction is up. We will be with God in heaven. And he's using our trials for that purpose. Now, as we get into this passage, I called this passage, the, the, I entitled this sermon, Acts of Resistance. Acts of his resistance. I want, at the end of this sermon, I want us to, to have our, have our, be encouraged to join the resistance. We are going to come together to fight, fight sin. We're going to fight together to beat sin. 
You know, when, when we were, as we were growing up, maybe you remember this, maybe you actually are experiencing this now. Let's say a child is at dinner and they look down at the food and they realize this is not something that I want to eat. So it's not, it's not pizza, it's not hot dogs, it's not mac and cheese, it's some type of casserole. You can't, you, you don't know what it is. It's delicious, right? Mom, mom makes, mom makes nothing that doesn't taste good. But a child says, oh, I, I don't, I don't want to eat this. What did, were you told when you, t what, when you said to your mother that you didn't want to eat that? Well, one thing I was told was, well, there's people over in Af Africa that are starving, right? <laughs> Now, when I got old enough, I'd say, well, let, let's ship it over to them. <laughs> she would say these things because she wanted me to just stop. She, was, she wanted me to stop my whining, right? I was suffering, and she wanted me to stop my whining. You know, see, that's not much of a solution, is it? Stop your whining, just eat. Peter approaches suffering a lot differently than that. He doesn't just say to you, well, you shouldn't whine, you shouldn't complain, stop complaining. He says, your suffering has a purpose, your suffering has a guaranteed goal. And what Peter is doing in this passage is he wants us to see that the acts of suffering remind us of the ultimate sufferer. Now, if you grew up in the Catholic Church, that was hammered into you. I grew up until I was 12 years old in the Catholic Church, and often when I was struggling with something, I'd be pointed, look at that crucifix. Look at Jesus Christ suffering on the cross. And that's, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to be reminded of the suffering of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, the Catholic Church <laughs> has many other things that have uh, problems with it, but what we want to hammer home is this idea of when we are suffering, remember, nobody suffered more than Jesus Christ. And he did it willingly and quietly. He endured more mental and physical and emotional suffering than anybody on earth. His suffering went so deep that it went spiritual. Such a deep spiritual suffering that he was separated from God himself. So as we get into this passage, keep your mind on the suffering of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 through 6 says this. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. And that, uh, uh, the, um, let, me, let me read that again. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So Peter wants us to focus on the ultimate sufferer as we are going through our own acts of suffering. Why? Well, he wants to encourage them. Throughout this whole book, Peter has been encouraging uh, the, the, the exiles that in their sufferings, they can still they can still be obedient. Even though their sufferings are directed right at their own, at their faith, it seemed, they can still be, uh, they can still think of Jesus Christ the sufferer and be obedient. Because of Jesus Christ and his suffering, we have the tools, the tools in order to suffer and rejoice, to suffer and not sin. In fact, we have the tools to suffer and be victorious. Think about that. Whatever you're struggling with, you can come out victorious. 
you still have your ability to continue in your faith. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can still have faith in God through your suffering. You still, according to Peter, love Jesus Christ. Even though you don't see him, you love him. You still have the ability to love others, other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And you still, even though you are suffering for your faith, have a desire to tell others about their faith. This is what Peter said in the first chapter of this letter. We still have all these tools in spite of our suffering. Now, I imagine as Peter, as people are reading through Peter's letter, you know, they're looking around at the things, the bad things that are happening to them, and they, th they think, what, I have the tools to endure this? You know, and they're holding out the thing that is hurting them the most. I have the tools to endure this? And Peter is writing emphatically, yes, yes, you do. Remember, back just a couple chapters ago, he said in chapter 2, for, this, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Whatever you're dealing with right now, you have been called to endure. You've been called to be reborn so that you can endure this. You've been called, you came to a new life in Jesus Christ so you can endure what you're going through. Now, his suffering didn't just bring you into a, a living hope. We talked about this earlier. He doesn't bring you into a, he didn't, uh, his suffering doesn't just bring you to a place of an imperishable inheritance. His suffering didn't just make you and put you into these categories of, remember the chosen race, right? You remember the, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, and the people belonging to God. That's not the only thing his suffering did, did. He didn't just label you a Christian. He gave you a life of being a Christian. You've been called to a holy life, and God's, God's call is effective. When God calls you to a holy life, that means you will live a holy life because you're a believer in him. This is why Peter says, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's a promise. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will be holy. Christ suffered to leave them an example to follow. And it's one that Jesus Christ knows we can follow it. You might be looking at Jesus and saying, can, there's, is, me, I can follow that example? Peter says very simply, yes, you have been called. You've been equipped to follow that example. Now, Peter knows that Jesus Christ's shoes are big shoes to fill. But he doesn't back down. He doesn't, he doesn't temper his words. He still says, yes, you can suffer, you can endure, because he's confident about what Jesus Christ did for us when he suffered. In 1 Peter 3.18, we saw earlier that, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Bringing, or being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. Because Jesus Christ suffered, he is bringing us to God by our faith in him. We can be uh, brought into God's presence, separate from the consequences that the world will face. You know, we were separated, by the con we're separated from the consequences of the world, but we're also separated from the world's pleasures. We're separated so that we can move forward in life to, in a new direction. And we are moving forward facing some, po some forces that oppose us. They oppose, they oppose God's desires. They oppose our desires. They, uh, and and they, they actually try to insert themselves into our lives. So what today we're going to do is in join in a resistance. We're going to resist ourselves. We're going to discover how to resist ourselves. We're going to discover that we need to resist our past. That's an interesting discussion. And then we're going to see 
we have to resist others. Simply put, peer pressure. Remember that idea? Remember back when you were a teenager? You know, everybody says, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta battle peer pressure. Well, that doesn't end when you become an adult. So first of all, let's take a look at resisting ourselves. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So what he's saying here, Peter's saying, in order to fight sin and to endure trials and temptations, don't just stand there. Do something. Arm yourself. Prepare yourself. Take hold of the equipment that Jesus Christ gave you so that you can get past the pain and get past the humility of your trials, that get past the inconvenience of, something, of, 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 of suffering, and think outside of yourself. He's saying arm yourself so that you can think outside of yourself, outside of your situation. Stop focusing on your oppressors and focus on Jesus Christ and focus on his sufferings. These sufferings, these, these things that he suffered so that we can suffer, these things are bringing us into God's presence and making us holy. So when we think outside of our trials and our struggles, we recognize we are being made holy. Verse 2, as you, I'm sorry, you continue in verse, through verse 1. It says, For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. This part is a little difficult to translate. You might be thinking that yourself. Boy, what does that mean? Is Peter trying to say that all a person has to do is suffer and they won't sin anymore? How many people are able to do that? Anybody? Anybody? No, of course that can't be what he's saying. This whole book is all about how to resist sin. If there was no problem, all you had to do was suffer, there'd be like one paragraph and that would be it. Just su start suffering and you won't sin anymore. That's not what he's saying. In fact, if we look back through the history of, of, uh, of Israel, s a pharaoh suffered greatly through the ten plagues. Did he repent? Absolutely not. Was he still sinning? Absolutely. So sin, you know, or I'm sorry, suffering does not stop sin. You continue to sin through, you s through suffering. In fact, some people grow more bitter towards Christ through their suffering. A misinterpretation of this passage has caused people to, uh, there, there's, um, I, I've seen this uh, in, in, like on YouTube where people will, because of passages like this, will take these little whips and, and beat themselves with the whips, thinking that that's driving out sin. And that's wrong. I don't expect anybody to go out and create for themselves one of these little whips and start beating themselves. Don't do that. That's not what this is saying. What Peter is saying is that those who suffer in the flesh, just as Christ did, have ceased from sin. Because of their faith, they have ceased from being a slave to sin. They have ceased, because of their faith in Jesus Christ, being condemned by sin. They have ceased, because of their faith in Jesus Christ, from being conquered by sin. And as we yield ourselves to God underneath the blood of Jesus Christ, we can have the same thinking towards, G towards sin that Jesus had. It can, this can be overcome. We can overcome the old life. We can demonstrate a life obey, obedient to Jesus Christ by not being dominated by sin. In fact, I was reading a commentary, and this is not my own thought, but I love this, and I'm actually going to use this now going forward. Think of this, think of this passage in this way. Think of our suffering as a way to wean ourselves off of always expecting to get our own way. I love that, I, that thought. I am suffering, and I am not getting my own way. Use it as a way to prepare yourself to not always get your own way. That's an old, bad habit, isn't it? If I don't get my way, then I'm going home. 
Use your suffering. Embrace the suffering. Use it as practice. Practice the feelings of not getting your own way when you're trying to flee human passions, when you're trying to flee sin. When so, you, you're going to feel like, oh, this is horrible. I'm not getting my way. When you suffer, you got the same feelings. When you get a sense, then, then when you do that, you get a sense of what it feels like to win, to be victorious over sin. My brother-in-law, uh, before he passed away, he built his own house. I remember this years ago. Is Pam in here? How old was he? Pam's not in here. Oh, all right. Well, he was really young when he, was, when he built his first house. Um, he grabbed all bu a whole bunch of his friends. Pam and I helped out, we, and his mom and dad, and we all built his house. It took lots and lots of work. There was many mistakes. There was months and months of long hours. This was the, in the days before YouTube. You couldn't just look up, how do you build a house, you know? He had to find out for himself. And then he, once he got that done, it was a beautiful little house. Then... On his own, he went and built, expanded that house. And then on his own, he built his own business. And then he built another business. By the time he had passed away, my brother-in-law died when he was 50 years old, he had three businesses, a big, gorgeous house, and a hundred and some acres of land that had a Christmas tree farm. That's impressive. But I think one of the things he, that I, I think that he learned how to win, how to be successful from that first house that he built. It was hard. It was massively hard. It was time consuming. But it gave him the understanding of what it feels like to win, to succeed. That's what suffering can do for us. As we don't get our way, we know what it feels like. And then when we resist sin, we're going to know what it feels like not to get our own way. Now that's excellent. That's a really great thought. But God knows that there are things that fight against you. And this thing, this one thing that, that is fighting against you hits you right in the conscience. It's something that Satan uses against you all the time. And this is an obstacle that will never, ever go away. And it's what we've done up until the point of our salvation. Not only do we have to resist ourselves, but we have to resist our past. Does anybody have a perfect past where they've never sinned? Of course not. Because before you knew Jesus Christ, you admitted that you were a sinner. Look at what Jesus Christ says that some of these Gentiles did. For the time ha that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality and, pa uh, um, and passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So we were saved from sin. So we were sinners before we came to know Jesus Christ. And for some of us, we sinned with a vengeance. We put 110% of our energy into doing exactly the opposite of what God wants us to do. Some of us are sitting today, standing here, with sins that we regret and I'm sorry if you're reminiscing on that now, what, what has happened in your past, but I'm here to tell you that Peter says you can get past that. Look at the life of sin that Peter knew existed in some people's past that he was writing to at the time. He said, you are, uh, uh, you are deal, uh, uh, delving into sensuality. What he meant there was any unrestraint. Um, uh, uh, unrestra any, any activity that's unrestrained by morality. He said passions. This is excessive cravings to do the things that displease God. Passions to displace affections from God to other things. 
He said drunkenness. Now, this doesn't just mean alcohol, but it's also any, any substance that's used to affect a person's uh, a, a, a perception or providing a distraction. Orgies. He's talking about binge parties. Basically, uh, having a, a party that has of excessive eating and drinking, and it just throws morality out the window. Drinking parties, they would actually host them, make sure that everybody knew about them, brought them together so that they can do all these things. And they had lawless idolatry, giving all of these activities religious significance. Can you imagine that? That's what the sin that people were involved in with. And can you imagine the consequences of those sins? You know, today we deal with consequences from our past decisions. You know, we've left a trail, and I say we, I've done the same thing. We've left a trail of hurting people. We've left a trail of financial ruin. We've, we've harmed our own bodies. We've harmed our own minds and our own psyche. We have done a lot of damage. Our past has given us so many memories, too. It's not just bad memories, right? Some of us, we think back on the things that we did, and we enjoyed them. We had a good time with these memories, and so much so that we devoted ourselves to fulfilling them. Do you know what they call that? Do you know what they call devoting yourself, developing a habit to fulfill a desire? you know what they call that? So that's an A. It's an addiction, right? Addiction is such an interesting word in the Bible. The, it's another word for devoting yourself to something. They, you've given yourself to something. And so there's horrible memories, and there's actually good memories. Good in the sense of enjoyable memories to our, our sin nature. Peter says that the past suffices for the sin. The past, the past is where the sin belongs. The past doesn't come with you across the line of where you came to know Jesus Christ is your Savior. That sin stays in the past. The past is where you discovered where you were depraved. That's where sin belongs. It belongs in a place that shows you your need of Jesus Christ. So you leave it back there. You leave your sin back there, and then you let it do what it's supposed to do, remind you of your need for Jesus Christ. Yes, your sin is back there. Yes, it had a heyday in your life, but those days are over. It's like a, 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 a man who's wearing a high school football jacket 20 years after he graduated from high school. Those glory days are over, sir. Take that jacket off and put it in the closet. Put it away. Burn it. Right? That's what sin is. It had its heyday in your life. Let it go. It did its purpose. Now, while its earthly consequences may still be with you, the eternal consequences are not. Praise God. <laughs> Therefore, we're not called to be devoted to sin any longer. And that's good. But yet, we're not done yet because there's still another entire system of thinking that is fighting against you and it's our peers it's the people that we partied with it's the people that we enjoyed the debauchery with you know we've war we're warring against our own nature we're warring against our past and now we consider warring against our peers first four says with respect to this they your peers, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. I thought, what a great, what a, Peter is, is honest. <coughs> Look at how he deals with the reality. You see their reaction? It's, it, it's not that they're, they're, they're not happy for us, but of course they're, at this point they're not angry with us. They're just, you see the word? Surprised. This is a sincere reaction. It's not necessarily an evil reaction. They're, they're just surprised. The word for surprised here is, is, a uh, is defined as to be impacted by something strange or something new. 
When, when they see that you've changed your behavior or when they see you're not joining them in their debauchery, their honest to goodness reaction is, wait, wh what? They, and, and maybe they'd send a text to one another. You know, uh, so-and-so is not going to be joining us tonight. Shake my head. That's a SMH when you're texting. You see SMH in texting? It means shake my head. What? Why are they surprised? Well, because these activities, this debauchery, whatever they're doing that's sinful, is something they've been doing their entire lives. It's something that they, they it belongs in their life. As far as they're concerned, this is how you do life. This is how you, you get through life. This is how you spend your downtime, or, or this is how you deal with struggles. That's just the way it is. And God says that they're surprised because their debauched lifestyle fits perfectly with their sin nature. Doesn't that make sense? That's why we were so happy with it. It fits our, it fits our sin nature. It fits their natural impulses. It fits their thinking. It fits with their passions and their goals. And so when somebody behaves with God's desires in mind, it just it doesn't make sense. What? Sh shake my head. You know, it also shines a light on their own sin. You know, even though they're surprised, even though it's something that they think fits, they still know it's a sin. And so they're at the crossroad. Do they repent? Or do they reject? You know, Peter says they reject. In fact, it's, it's kind of interesting. You would hope that they would say, well, just if they don't accept it, at least they just say live and let live. Peter doesn't say that. He says they will, what's that word? They will what? That's right. I heard it inside of your heads. Malign, right? They'll malign you. In other words, they'll slander you. We've talked about this earlier. They will slander you. Because, because our lives are testimonies, those who participate in the debauchery, they look at these loud, clear testimonies of our lives who are walking away from that debauchery and they defend themselves against it. And they slander us. They want our testimony to, be look, to look foolish. They want our lives to look uh, idiotic. It doesn't make sense and so they slander us. And so when the disciple of Christ in frustration says, why do people slander me when all I want is good? And it's because of this. This is their motive. Our lives expose their sin and they feel guilty. And instead of accepting it, they return or they turn against God and they turn against his people. And verse 6 says, For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So after thinking of all this, what, of, of, all the, of these three things, the, these things that we're warring against ourselves, uh, our, our past, and our peers, Peter says, this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead. Now this statement has three possible meanings. If you read uh, any, any number of commentaries, you can see people take different sides on this. And there's an unfortunate uh, uh, teaching that has come out of this passage. Some people say that because of this passage, it says that those who have died without hearing or believing the gospel have a second chance once they've died to hear the gospel again. Now, if you've heard that, don't believe it. There is no scriptural support for that at all. Once a person has died and entered the presence of God, if they don't know Jesus Christ, they are condemned, and that's it. And, and, it, it, and this is why today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. There's no scriptural support. There's no confidence you will have at all, that you should have at all, that you will hear the gospel once you are dead. So truly then, what is, what does it mean by those who are dead? You know, 
it could be one of the next two. You know, I've, I've reasoned through them, thought through it a while, and it's like either one works, and, and maybe later on you and I can have a discussion about what you think is better, but let's take the first idea. How about those who, the, the, those who are dead are actually those who are spiritually dead in sin, right? And those, the gospel is a priest to those who are alive today who are dead in sin. And even though uh, they are, uh, okay, yeah, and, and even though they're judged by people now, even though they're looked at from the outside and, and judged by people, they, those who are dead in sin will resist that judgment, will resist those who will want them to come in and be a part of their debauchery and come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Or it could be those who've died already because they've been suffering, or if maybe they've died through their suffering, and while they were alive, they heard it and received it. And even though they were judged and put to death by those who judged them in the flesh, they, now, they are now alive with Jesus Christ. Whether it's B or C, whether it's B or C, the believers face a different future than those who rejected Jesus Christ. Rather than facing judgment for their sins, their penalty has been paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. The last earthly effect of sin is physical death, but after physical death, they are led to eternal life. So what we need to remember is when we're suffering, when we're struggling against sin, against trials, when we're dealing with fiery trials, God says resist. Join the resistance. Resist your own sin nature, your sinful desires. Resist your own past, your regrets, your memories of the good and the bad. Resist your peers. Be ready for their surprise. Be ready for them to turn on you and be ready for them to malign you. You see, there's, the world has no desire to resist sin. And so you shouldn't either, according to the world. Talking about this idea of peer pressure, there was a, okay, this is a story. There wasn't really a spider talking, but there was a spider who built a beautiful web in this old house. He kept it clean and shiny so that flies would just almost want to be in it. And the minute that he caught a fly, he would immediately take care of it. You know, he would immediately eat it. He would clean it up and then he would keep, then he would make sure that his web was clean again so that other flies would not get suspicious. Then one day, this fairly intelligent, intelligent fly came buzzing by this clean spider web and the old spider said to the fly, come on in and sit down and join me. But the fly, very intelligent, said, no, sir, I won't do that. I don't see any other flies in your house. I'm not going in alone. But eventually the fly saw something else. On the floor below the web was a large crowd of flies. And they were dancing around on this brown piece of paper. Well, there we go. There we go. I, 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 I'm not afraid to go. There's lots of flies down there, and they look like they're having a great time dancing and, and dancing around. So he came in for a landing, and just before he landed, a bee zoomed by and said, don't land there, that's fly paper. But the fairly intelligent fly shouted back, don't be silly, those flies are dancing. There's a big crowd down there. Everybody's doing it. That many flies can't be wrong. He went down and he died with the rest of them. Some of us want to be part of the crowd so badly that we end up in a mess. What does it profit us, a fly or a person, if we escape the web but only end up in the glue? So I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, we have been equipped to resist the temptations of falling away 
from Jesus Christ in our trials and our temptations. I want to encourage you to fight sin. Fight, the, uh, resist the memories of the good and the bad of your sin and resist your peers. And then this church will become that church that we want it to be. One filled with people who are, have been enriched in their life with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. I thank you, Father, for the precious love that you give us. I thank you, Lord, for showing us your son, your son who died, and because of his death, because of his suffering, we can suffer and endure and have faith. Oh, Lord God, we are equipped. And so, Lord, let us take the tools that we've been equipped with and fight sin in Jesus' name. Amen.